I count it an extreme privilege to be with you today. What a, what a great church uh, you are, and it's just such a great thing for me to be able to be here. I'm blessed to be in your presence today and just sense the Holy Spirit already here in this room working and doing his, his amazing wonders. And I'm very grateful for Pastor Tom. He didn't tell me what to say today. And I, this first part, particularly, he didn't tell me what to say because I want to tell you, he is such a wonderful man, isn't he? How many of you agree with me on that? He's a, a, a good pastor. He's been faithful for many, many years to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I love him as, as, as a brother. I'm so grateful for the friendship that I've been able to have with Tom over the years. And I'm just very happy to be with you today. So we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit today. And when you embrace the truth of this message, I believe it can enable us to have a greater closeness with Jesus. How many of you like to be closer to Jesus today, okay? Yes. I believe it's going to help us with relationships, and I think it also can give us a purpose and a meaning in life that perhaps we didn't have before. Does that sound good to you? Okay. Yes. We're talking about being saturated with the Spirit, and as I talk today, think about what are some reasons why people hesitate to give themselves fully over to God, to let Him fill them up with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray as we start. Thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity. I worship you, Lord. This is a message I, I give unto you. It's, it's, it's what, what I do today as I worship you, and I thank you for uh, just this opportunity to speak to this awesome, wonderful group of people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When I was growing up, we used to sing the doxology. How many remember the doxology? You know, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And it goes, Amen. Yeah, remember that song? Yeah. The pastor sometime would also pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And even as a young guy, I was smart enough to figure out that the Father that he was referring to was Father God. And I was also smart enough to understand that the Son was Jesus, but who in the world is the Holy Ghost? You know, I always wondered that. The only frame of reference I had was Casper the Friendly Ghost that I used to <laughs> watch when I was growing up, a popular cartoon character. You know, the, the, the image of a ghost, you know, uh, a white, perhaps black, shadowy figure, you know, floating through the air, you know, that was kind of the image I had of the Holy Ghost, you know. I found out later it's best to refer to him as the Holy Spirit. In fact, modern translations reflect that fact, that he is the Holy Spirit. There was a man who was feeling really good about himself one day when he went to God in prayer. And here's what he said. He said, Dear God, so far today, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been grumpy, greedy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. And I'm very thankful for that. But it's morning. In a few minutes, Lord, I'm going to be getting out of bed. <laughs> and that's when I really begin to struggle. I'm going to need your help. You know. Perhaps you can relate to that guy, you know, praying a great prayer in the morning, God, I'm going to serve you, I'm going to live for you today, and then get distracted. As soon as you get out of bed, things start happening. So by God's grace, I became a follower of Jesus when I was a teenager in high school. And the first couple of years went pretty good, but I remember about two years into it, I just was praying this prayer in the morning. I'd get up and say, God, I just give myself to you. I want to keep you... I want to keep my mind and my heart focused on you throughout the entire day. And then every night I go before God and say, you know, Lord, it seemed like I got distracted again. I hardly even thought about you during the day. It's just this, you know, I'm so sorry about that. And so I, I came up with a brilliant strategy. I, I put some rubber bands on my finger. I thought this is going to help remind me, the nice and tight, it's going to remind me of God's presence in my life all throughout the day. And I remember... <laughs> How embarrassed I was when this girl at school, I'm a teenager at high school, girl comes up to me, what's those rubber bands doing on your fingers? And I said, well, uh, one of them stands for I need God always, and the other one is he's with me. <laughs> he's always with me. And she just kind of nervously kind of said, oh, uh, well, great, that's great, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, 
But that was my desire, to, to have a closeness with Jesus. And later on, not that long after that, I actually found out there's a better solution than rubber bands. It's learning to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Lord wants for each one of us. Now, the Bible makes it clear that the Holy Spirit is God. He works in specific events, and he works through specific situations and through people to accomplish his purpose on this earth. So let me ask you this. Have you taken the time to learn about the Holy Spirit, and have you allowed the Holy Spirit to fill and saturate your life? This is an important point I want to make sure you, you hear. If you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, according to Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, the Bible says very specifically that you have the Spirit already living inside of you. Isn't that good news? Okay. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. And that's really good news. But I would contend, I would suggest, that it's one thing for us to have the Holy Spirit. It's another thing for the Holy Spirit to have us. Let me say it again. That's kind of my main point here. It's one thing for us to have the Holy Spirit, but it's another thing for him to have us, all of us. He wants all of us, and we need to take that step. Now, I have some breaking news this morning. In 155 days, only 155 days, Christmas is going to occur, okay? So you're running out of time to get your shopping done, okay? And the reason I bring up Christmas is because every Christmas season, we always hear about Virgin Mary, how the Holy Spirit came upon her, and the child that was conceived in her is Jesus, the Son of God. But later on, when Jesus was 30 years old, about 30 years old, he enters the waters of baptism with John the Baptist. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 3, verse 21, it says, and as, as he was praying, the Holy Spirit came down upon him in the form of a dove, and the Father spoke from heaven. What did the Father say? This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So, a powerful encounter with the Holy Spirit. This was not just a momentary kind of touch from the Holy Spirit that Jesus experienced on that day. Because we know in the very next chapter, in Luke chapter 4, verse 1, it says Jesus was filled with the Spirit. It says Jesus was led by the Spirit. In verse 14 of chapter 4, it says Jesus returned from Jordan in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then, in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 21, he gets up in the synagogue in his hometown, and he has amazing confidence to say this. He quotes from Isaiah 61. He says this, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then in verse 21, he boldly say, says, it says, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus had power to help the poor and to heal the brokenhearted and to set the captives free, to open blind eyes, to set demonized people at liberty. He walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. So here's an important point to make today. If Jesus, the perfect, sinless Son of God, chose to live his life in the power of the Holy Spirit, how much more do we, who are imperfect children of God, need to live in the power of the Holy Spirit today? You know, in John chapter 7, Jesus gets up and he says in a loud voice, he said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. He's not talking about H2O in this passage. We all need water to live, right? He's talking about our spiritual lives. He's talking about the kind of emptiness and the kind of loneliness, the, the kind of, of uh, missing peace that happens spiritually, and only he can satisfy the deepest longings of our soul. How many of you know that you can try drugs and you can try excessive drinking and illicit sex and pursuing riches and fame and fortune and all that kind of stuff, but nothing really satisfies your soul until you make peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you come to me, he says, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. But then in verse 38, 
He goes on and says this, whoever believes in me, now notice the transformation that takes place. As scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Jesus was glorified when he went to the cross, when he was raised from the dead, when he ascended to heaven at the right hand of God the Father. And since that time, the Lord not only wants to fill us with his spirit, but he wants the life-giving presence of the Holy Spirit to flow out of us like a mighty rushing river. So we need to come to Jesus. We need to, if you're thirsty, he says, I'm going to satisfy you. I'm going to satisfy the core of your being. But he also wants a transformation to begin to take place, not just a recipient, but a dispenser of the Holy Spirit. He wants the Holy Spirit to flow through us for the benefit of others. Now, in John chapter 14, verse 26, this is a, a scripture that took place within 24 hours of Jesus going to the cross. Okay, Jesus had a lot to say during that time. John 14, verse 26, he, he has this Passover meal, he does the foot washing, he does communion, and he, he says a lot of things about the Holy Spirit. One of them is in John 14, verse 26. He says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I've said to you. The advocate is also translated counselor, comforter, or helper. Literally, it's actually one call alongside to help. Okay? How many of you know that life is tough? <laughs> and it's really important to have the Holy Spirit alongside of us on a daily basis to help us through the tough times of life. He has everything we need. Now, that reminds me of a story. There was a professor, and he once said to his class, he said, anything that you can put on a piece of paper, you can use for the final exam. So people would take a piece of paper, and they write in real, real small letters and diagrams and charts and whatever, everything that they thought they would need for the final exam. And one guy, he actually thought, well, I'll take the professor literally, anything you can put on a piece of paper. So he got a graduate student to come and sit next to him on the piece of paper, <laughs> I stand next to him on a piece of paper, and he's able to ace the test with the help of the grad student. Okay. Now, the Holy Spirit is kind of like the grad student. When you have the tests and trials of life, he's right there giving you the wisdom you need, the strength you need, the power you need, everything you need. He provides for us in a, in a very gracious way. Jesus had a lot of, th of, of things to say about the Holy Spirit during that time just before he was crucified. He told his disciples, he said, the spirit of truth is going to be with you. He is with you now. He's going to be in you. He told them he's going to help you. He's going to teach you. He's going to bring things to your remembrance that you need to know. He's going to show you things to come. He's going to guide you into all truth. And Jesus said, he, he is going to glorify me. He's going to reveal the riches of Christ to you. See, the greatest benefit of a spirit-filled life is being close to Jesus, just having him just so close, closer than a brother. Shortly after making those statements, Jesus is hanging on a cross. That's not the end of the story. He was raised from the dead, and he appeared to them a number of times during a 40-day period, one of which was in John chapter 20, the night of the resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples. The Bible says they were behind closed doors for fear of the Jews in John chapter 20. And Jesus just suddenly appeared to them. And he said, peace be unto you. He showed them his hands and side because he wanted to make sure that they understood. He was, this is really Jesus raised from the dead, bodily raised from the dead. And then he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them, it says, and, it, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Just like when Adam, when God breathed on Adam and he became a living soul, he breathed resurrection life into his disciples on resurrection night. 
And these guys, it's like they became born again on that night. And then during that 40-day period, Jesus appeared to them a number of times. And in Acts chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, here's what it says. After his suffering, Jesus showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this suggestion. Now, actually, that's not what it says. This command... Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Forty days, Jesus appeared to them. One of the things he said is in Matthew 20, he said, Go into all the world, make disciples of all the nations. But then here in Acts chapter 1, he says, But don't go yet. I want you to wait. First thing I want you to do is wait, because I have a gift for you. You're going to need this gift. If you're going to fulfill the mission that you have in life, you're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. He to told them to wait in Jerusalem until they're clothed with power from the Holy Spirit, from power on high, he speaks of, clothed. Okay, He wants to fill us on the inside and clothe us on the outside. My friends, this is the power that we need to live the Christian life. This is the power that we need to love our friends and our neighbors and those who are outside of Christ. This is the power that we need to live in unity and have a body of Christ that actually reveals Christ to this lonely and lost world. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said these words. He said, you shall receive power after the Spirit comes upon you. And you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts, to the ends of the earth. Power. How many of you need the power of God today? I, I know I do. Absolutely. Notice it's a command, not a suggestion. And these people took it seriously. During that time, they were in prayer, constantly in praying. And then Acts chapter 2, here's what it says. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. I want you to notice here that there's two things that are filled. What, what were two things that were filled in this passage that I just read? The house. The house was filled. Very good. The, the, the wind is a picture of the Holy Spirit. The house was filled. And then what else was filled? Verse 4. Okay. The people were filled. Well, so what is the baptism in the Holy Spirit? Well, I just... I'm kind of a simple guy, to be honest with you. The baptism of the Spirit, then, is being inwardly filled and outwardly covered, surrounded, immersed in the Holy Spirit. I remember one time, years ago, I was in a Bible study, and a girl, we were talking about this passage, and a girl kind of put her hand up and said, oh, that's just like being saturated with the Spirit. You know something? I've never heard a better term than that to describe it. Inwardly filled outwardly surrounded, covered by the Spirit of God. It's a picture of intimacy, closeness. So close he wants to be in our lives. He wants to saturate us, drench us, consume us, submerge us in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the word baptize, okay, uh, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, and the Greek word for baptize is baptizo. And the Greeks use baptizo to describe the dyeing of cloth. I was actually going to get some dye and take a piece of cloth and demonstrate that, but I was worried I'd trip and fall and the dye would go over the floor. It wouldn't go over very good, okay? But, but think about that. You put, take some dye, put the cloth in. What happens? It saturates the cloth and it changes the whole appearance of the cloth. Contemporary Greek sources also spoke of baptizo as a submerged ship that went underneath the water. So the water, i give you a little example. So the water is in the ship, and the water is surrounding the ship. It's a beautiful picture 
So what does baptism mean? It means to be dunked under, to dip under, to immerse, to submerge. On the day of Pentecost, we see the disciples. We see Mary, the mother of Jesus, Jesus' brothers. They're filled with the Spirit. They begin to speak in languages that they'd never learned before, and a big crowd starts to gather. A bunch of people start gather, gathering to see what was going on because they were proclaiming uh, God's favor and God's glory in languages that they hadn't learned. Peter then got up and said these words, verse 15 through 18, these people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. You have to understand from God's eternal perspective, the last days literally refers to the time between Christ's first coming and Christ's second coming. So in essence, we're living in the last days even today. So I want to declare to you, the Lord is still pouring out his Holy Spirit. He's still saturating people's lives even today. He's still giving us fruit and gifts to glorify him. Now, this is an interesting passage because approximately seven weeks prior to this, is a little over seven weeks prior to this, if you remember the night that Jesus was betrayed, what happened to Peter? Remember what happened? He denied that he even knew Jesus. He's afraid. He chickened out when it all came down to giving a public witness in that time. But here... Peter is the one who gets up in the same city that Jesus was crucified. He's boldly declaring Jesus is Lord. He's resurrected from the dead. 3,000 people were saved in that day and baptized. And the very next chapter, there's a miraculous healing that took place in the temple through Peter and John. What happened? What happened to this guy? Well, let me tell you what happened to him. He was filled with to overflowing with the Spirit of God. And his life was turned around in the power of God. So, if you think about the book of Acts, it's normative. It was understood. When you give your life to Christ, you bear witness of that through baptism. Baptism is an inward expression, I'm sorry, an outward expression of an inward faith. It's a beautiful thing. It's giving public declaration to your faith. But it's also normative in the early church, and it should be normative today, that we pray and say, Lord Jesus, fill me up with the, the Holy Spirit. Saturate me. Every cell in my being, fill me up. Not just inwardly, but let it flow like a river out of me so that other people will be blessed by the way I live my life. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 is the last verse I'm going to use to, today. But Paul the Apostle says this. It's a powerful verse. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. That's a word we don't typically use nowadays. It means reckless, wild living. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, it says. Paul is clearly contrasting the difference between being under the influence of alcohol with being under the influence of the Spirit of God. How many of us are living our lives under the influence of the Spirit of God on a daily basis? Now, if you look again at the original language in the Greek, it's actually it's imperative. If you look at the verb, it's imperative. It means it's a command, okay? This is not a suggestion. This is something we all need to have happen, to be filled with the Spirit of God. It's also in the present tense, which means it's a continuous experience, not a one-time experience, but a daily type of experience. Every day, we should be going before the Lord. Lord, fill me up with the Spirit of God, because I want to be a tool in your hands to bless others and to live my life for your glory. Paul's not saying here in this passage, get yourself filled up or fill yourself up. He's saying, allow yourself to be continuously filled 
with the Spirit of God. Allow yourself. He wants to saturate us. He wants to fill us on the inside and surround us and cover us and envelop us on the outside. It's one thing for us to have the Holy Spirit. It's another thing for him to have us. Now, let me ask you this. Just I want to get a little participation from you. What is it that keeps people from giving their entire life over to God and saying, Lord, fill me up with the Spirit? What would be some reasons why some people would hesitate to pray that kind of serious prayer? Any, any thoughts? Fear. Okay, fear. Pride. Pride, okay, that's really good. Both of those are great answers, yeah. I, I remember when I was single, before, we've been married over 43 years, but I remember when I was single I, and I came to Christ, I thought, you know, man, if I, if I really get serious about just saying, Jesus, I'm all in, fill me up with the Spirit. He may tell me to go to Siberia as a missionary, and I don't like cold weather. That would not be fun. Or marry somebody I wasn't even attracted to. I mean, who knows what God's going to make me do? Make me do. Okay. Pride, gosh, yeah, I don't really need to rely on on the Holy Spirit every single day, every single minute of every day. That seems kind of tedious and kind of boring. You know? Actually, it's the greatest adventure you can ever have when the Spirit of God is free to work in and through your life. Any other thing? What, what keeps people? Yeah, Chuck. Poor yeah. Teaching. Well, poor teaching. Okay, that, that is excellent. Chuck said poor teaching, okay? A lot of people don't know about this awesome gift that you can have. And so we need to know more about it. We need to be aware of what the Bible says regarding the Holy Spirit. Well, let me just say this. If you want to be closer to Jesus, and I hope everyone would say yes, that, that's something I really would like, then, then ask him, fill me up, Lord God, with the Holy Spirit. Because he glorifies Christ. He lifts Christ up. And, and you'll, you'll get to experience him in ways you've never even dreamed of before. If you want to have a better relationship with other people, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you have a source of love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and kindness and faithfulness and self-control that goes way beyond your natural ability. It's called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Sometimes we, do, we don't have the love we need. We don't have the patience we need. We don't have the joy. How many of you could use a little bit more joy when we go through life's difficulties? It's all found in the Holy Spirit. How many of you like to live a life of impact, that your life can really make a difference with your children, with your grandchildren, with this community, <laughs> with, with this church? I want to be a blessing to this church. How many of you pray that kind of prayer? I want to be a blessing to this church. Well, the best way to be a blessing is to be filled up with the Holy Spirit because when you're filled up with the Holy Spirit, guess what happens? There's incredible gifts that show up when someone is filled up with the Spirit of God. Depends on who's counting. There's around 20 of them that are mentioned in the New Testament. These are supernatural abilities to enable you to minister to each other in the body of Christ, but also for us to impact the world because the world needs to see the fruit, in other words, the character of Jesus, and it needs to see the power of Jesus, which is demonstrated by the gifts that he provides for us. I encourage you to pray this prayer. Lord, is there any gifts that you have for me that I haven't yet received. I'm going to say it again. Lord, is there any gifts? Some of you have walked with God for a long time, and, and I, I think that's awesome. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all these seasoned saints, okay? But, but it's a good prayer. Lord, is there any gifts that you have for me that I haven't yet received? The greatest gift is the Holy Spirit, but when the Holy Spirit is in your life and filling you, who knows what kind of gifts are going to show up in your life? You'll find yourself doing things that, like, I, I didn't think I had the capacity. I didn't. How did that happen? <laughs> well, when the Spirit of God is in control, all kinds of amazing things can happen. So imagine, I, I remember seeing the sign as I pulled in today, uh, something about uh, misfits are welcome here. What, how, what's that sign say, Tom? What? A church for us misfits. Okay, imagine what the Lord can do with a, for a, with a church of misfits now filled up with the Holy Spirit of God 
baptized, immersed, submerged in the Spirit of God. Imagine what the Lord can do. It's not uh, your abilities. It's not your strength. It's not your power. It's not your education that really is going to make the difference. It's what God can do in and through your lives. But we have to be willing to say, okay, I'm not going to hold back anymore. I am in. I am all in. And God, whatever you want to do with me, is there any gifts you have for me that I haven't received? And God, just give them to me now. I pray for that. I pray for release of the Holy Spirit and the gifts. So as I close right now, I just want to have us pray. And I want to encourage you. Some of you have already experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's something to celebrate. Say, thank you, Lord, for all the ways you've revealed yourself to me and the power of your spirit. I, I've, I've touched on that. I, I've experienced that. But I want to encourage you on a daily basis, say, Lord, fill me up again, again and again and again and again. Just, just let it be like a river just flowing through me. I don't want to block it. I don't want to stop it. I don't want to hold anything back. I'm yours, Lord. I'm all yours. Are, are you willing to pray that prayer today? I hope so. It's a life of adventure. It's a life of encouragement where God takes a bunch of misfits like me and us and he turns them into a mighty army that can impact the world for Christ. Praise the Lord.